welcome to the machine building recitation. Now, I say all of my recitations are the my favorite, but this is my favorite of the favorites because this is at the heart of the roadmap of rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping the fab 2.0 stage of fab labs making fab labs so we have a group of star machine builders uh, their work will be impressive but remember all of them started like you and just discovered they liked doing this and they were good at doing it so you can become them uh, machines.fabcloud.io is a page of links that will grow into a, a, a portal. For now, it's just a page of links. And so we're going to rotate the screen share. We're going to go through this list. Um, and as we talk, I have a meta assignment to everyone, which is to look at opportunities to help uh, connect all of these projects. They've all, to some degree, radiated in independent directions, and I think there's an opportunity to strengthen their connections. So with that, I'll stop this share, and then we'll do, it's, it's five to 10 minutes a topic, depending on how much there is to cover. And we'll start with Claire and Quentin, take over the screen share. Yes, so good morning, everybody. I'm Claire, and I'm here with Quentin. Um, I took How to Make Almost Anything the year before last, and that was my introduction to machines. I'm here today to talk about Fab in a Box, which is an initiative some of you might have heard of. It is from Fab Foundation, and it's the Center for Bits and Atoms, which is the lab that Neil runs at MIT. And it's taken two different directions here. We'll talk about both very briefly, since this is a lightning round. The first is a commercial off-the-shelf version of a kit of curated machines. You'll hear a lot today about custom-built machines. This is custom-curated machines instead. And the other is not a kit of custom curated machines, it is custom built machines. We internally refer to these as COTS, commercial off the shelf, C-O-T-S, and NOTS, not off the shelf. And so what you're looking at here is the commercial off the shelf version. It is a 40 watt diode laser cutter, the smoke purifying system in the lower left hand corner here to make that safe to run in the cart, an enclosed 3D printer, a vinyl cutter, a control computer to run everything, and then the custom built cart that you see here that really makes it unique because it's ideal for educational settings where you can easily move it around. And all of that is priced under $10,000, which I say because sometimes in even resource constrained environments, you do have to make the decision about whether you're going to build your own machine or whether you're going to purchase machines. These are really low cost machines, so they might be more prudent for you if they're just a means to an end and if they're not the end themselves. And then if you need something that is more custom or that you want to have be more versatile and you can switch end effectors, like you'll hear from a lot of folks later today, you might choose to do a custom built machine instead in the knots direction. But this does in environmental, in educational environments, for example, give you warranty and liability on manufacturers that frees you up to focus on what you're creating. And you can actually use these machines to create other machines, smaller, more versatile drawing machines, for example. So the link on Neil's website will take you to this uh, website here that will walk you through the bill of materials that is on here if you're curious about low cost alternatives to building your own. And then I will let Quentin talk about Knots, which is the not off the shelf version of Fab in a Box that is custom built uh, machines. Just, just a moment more on mm -hmm. Fab in a Box. Um, uh, a couple points on it. One was for many years, SolidWorks worked with us to help donate labs. And that's what lab to, led to the labs in Rwanda and Nepal and Puerto Williams. Um, and then had this nice suggestion of rather than one big lab, what if we made 10 small labs? And so we've been talking about this for a while and their support helped, helped drive it. And so Quentin and uh, Claire did a lot of work uh, vetting these machines, in particular mm -hmm. looking at open protocols to talk to them and ways to have consistent interfaces across them is what went into the curation. And we found actually, even though it seems sort of straightforward to just put a few machines in a box, tremendous demand of people wanting to know how, how can we get one. And you're right, Neil, what I neglected to talk about is the fact that these machines were chosen not just because they're low cost, high value in terms of what you can do with them, but because you can control them with open source software like mods, which are many of you are probably familiar with at this point. So we did choose things that we could get into on the back end for the machine control, which does make them much more versatile for our use. Okay, Quentin. Yeah, no, I, I don't have much to add. This was a perfect summary from, from Claire. Um, but, you know, at some point, 
So what, what Clearshot was for setting up new fab labs very quickly um, and for spaces that don't have much budget. So that's why we went for something that's less than 10K. It's an order of magnitude less than uh, what you find right now when setting up a new lab. But for existing spaces that care about very specific processes or have you know the experience already, then you might think about building your own machines. Uh, and that's that's still ongoing. That's still something we're figuring out. Um, I'll let Jake talk about his modular machines. And the when the clank is a great example of a machine that you know has a an end effector that can change. And so you could imagine having just one machine with five different end effectors rather than five different machines. So yeah, Jake will, will talk more about that. Um, okay, and, and this flow, all... we're, yeah, in the flow, we're, we're ordering it from short term to long term. So shortest term is just commercial off the shelf with some curation. And then the, the knots direction we'll hear a lot about. And so Leo, are you on for blot? I am, yeah. Okay. So uh, next one is you could view this as the minimal minimum viable knots machine. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Can you see my my screen? Yep. All looks good. Great. Okay. So I'll start with a little little background on myself. So I I'm a former fab nomad, um, which means uh, after I graduated college, I traveled around the world visiting fab labs and doing projects with people. So um, love the fab community. Super excited to to share stuff with you. And I was really lucky The literally the first day of my trip, I went to Norway and uh, went to the closest fab lab I could find there because I was really eager to get started. And I thought I was doing something kind of unique and said, oh yeah, I'm traveling around the world visiting these labs. And they said, oh yeah, we got one of those guys too. And uh, met Jens, who's on this call too. And you'll hear from him in a little bit. And Jens was like my first machine building mentor that I ever had. So I ended up, um, building some machines with him that you'll be able to hear more about later, the better ones than the ones that I worked on. Um, and that was like my introduction to machine building. And it, it was really amazing because it gave me this context that I've used for kind of situating like all of the learning I've done about technology later. Um, and that's really interesting to me to find this like great context for this great mental scaffolding for learning about technology, because my day job now is that I work at a nonprofit called Hack Club, which is this big uh, global network of teenagers that uh, support each other in doing self-directing, self-directed learning in technology and coding. And we do a lot of different things. Um, we help people run events and we support crazy events. Like uh, we did a hackathon where we put 42 teenagers on a train and brought them across the country with like a industrial server. Um, that we built themselves and they built their own internet on the train. Uh, we support after school coding clubs that are run by teens. And I started a program there called You Ship We Ship, where we basically make creative coding environments online. And when young people create things in these tools and share them publicly, then we send them more materials to investigate those topics and go deeper into them. So the first one of these projects was a game console that you can't buy. You can only get it by building a game for it. So it has this web-based um, creative coding environment uh, here that's custom made for this editor. And when people build games and share them, then we send them a hardware kit. And uh, this has been out for about a year with kids all around the world making all sorts of games in here. And the next project getting into the topic of today is uh, to introduce kids to digital fabrication and machine building. So it's a pen plotter. And the way that it works is that um, young people can create uh, programmatic line art in this custom editor online. And when they share that art publicly, by submitting it to the gallery as a PR, then we'll send them this machine that can actually turn that art into a physical thing. So uh, this is a glimpse of the editor. I'll show it in a second. Uh, this is an example of the sort of art that people can make. And then they receive the machine as this kit. And we built everything from scratch, uh, the editor itself, 
this website you're looking at right now. And of course the machine design and then also all aspects of the, of the machine design. So like re-implemented, you know, firmware um, from scratch and used common design patterns. And the idea was to make a machine that people could really explore and investigate at like all levels from the design tool that they're using um, with it to the CAM system, which is really direct to the hardware design itself. And this is going to go public next week, actually. We've been in like an open beta um, with people in the community testing it, and we're going to start offering it to uh, any teen around the world. Uh, of course, everything is open source. So anyone on this call can uh, dig into this material. You can make things in the editor if you want, um, but you'll have to produce your own parts for the machine if you want to build it which should be no problem because they're all in fab labs. So the bill of material. So, sorry, Leo, for time, we're going to have to go on. I think that's enough to introduce the project. Okay, great, because I'm done. We won't have time. For, just it, If you can point to the links, we won't have time to do the demo. Sure, uh, that was about it. Uh, the only the demo was just, here's the editor. But uh, yeah, if you have any okay. questions, feel free to reach out and uh, glad to share. Uh, any one of these projects can fill the hour. The goal is to see uh, tour them. So. Um, that's the minimum viable machine. We'll go to Rahul initially in Kerala, who, who started just one step beyond that, which is um, how simple can you make it um, a, a useful machine be beyond a demonstration machine? Or sorry, useful yeah. isn't the right term, but um, displacing some of the tools in the Fab Lab. But all of these are useful. Go ahead, Rahul. Exactly. Uh, uh, hi, Neil. So my Fab journey kind of started on 2017 when I joined the a fab lab in Chirandram. I've been part of them for five plus years and I now work in a company that makes 3D printed shoes. So I want to talk to you about, about uh, my small project called Fab Neo. So basically uh, I wanted to make machine building as simple as possible. And the way I did that was to make uh, the components as easy as possible. So instead of building a general purpose machine that is that has strengths and weaknesses, we built a specific machine that you can tailor to your needs. So, and I chose PCB milling machine as the one because it is a core part of any fab lab and the process lends itself well to optimization, like extreme optimization. So below that is, uh, is the things which I've done. I've go, let me go through one by one. So essentially for a PCB milling machine, you only need two accurate heights, one to mill out the traces, one to mill out the board. So I thought about the way I optimized that was that to, through the use of a flexion mechanism. So in this, you can see the whole diagram, it's a compound flexion. So it's both for one for the Z axis, one to take out the parasitic motion of the cam. And here you can see it in actuation. So this was like the first spark of the idea of like, why cannot we replace the whole Z axis of a machine with just a one single part print? So this was 3D printed in the Prusa, it survived for maybe hundred revolutions until it broke. Then I need to, I needed a way to iterate on the different designs as well as shapes and materials. So I go went from 3D printed to CNC milled to a different materials like HDPE and Delrin. And below here you see the first one that was actually working on the machine. And sticking to the same concept of uh, easy to manufacture, I also milled my own plane bearings so you can make the whole machine uh, in house milled on a CNC mill. So. In fabrication wise, the whole machine was milled out of uh, on the Zund. Here you can see that all the parts are made out of HDPE. These are standard CNC milled parts. And for the spindle, on the first generation, I use the same spindle as that of the Modella. And from here, the first generation of the machine was born. So here you can see it's really tiny. It only fits the board that's a standard size of 10 by seven centimeters. And it's smaller than a laptop. So here you can see the actual working of the mechanism. What I kind of realized was that the, the flexion mechanism had promise, but the whole mechanism did not have the rigidity I wanted. So I went on a whole optimizing spree at, uh, trying to find out which design works, like how to optimize the, the flexures for rigidity as well as being able to actuate it. And from that, the second version was born. So as you can see, the whole machine is a lot smaller now. And I used really hard to machine parts, kind of like here, if you can see, yeah. 
So this is a different design from the previous one. I used poly, uh, phenolic laminates, and these are all delring bushings inside it. So the fabrication is same. We milled all the parts out of it, but this is from much stiffer material. So what that allowed us to do was to make really good results out of, out of the existing frame which we had. So here, you can see here, it's really usable as a machine there. Then, so yes, from here, so while I was working on this, my colleague Sibu mentioned to me, like, since the machine is so small, why can't we print the whole machine into one, in one printer? So that's when I went, out, went down the rabbit hole of 3D printing the whole machine. And from there, the Pico is born. And this whole design, you can print in your Prusa. So this all, uh, it's printed in three parts. The total time is less than 40 hours. And you get all the parts printed out there. Then you assemble them together. And initially, the test was not that great because I had some problems with uh, stability on the, on the whole frame because it was not as rigid as I thought it would, would be. And I kind of went for a whole new redesign. So this, as by far, is the final version of Pico. That is an entirely 3D printed PCB mill that is actually functional. And you can see there's some small design changes here for improving rigidity here. And the whole thing is it resembles a small cube and it takes up really less space. So the fabrication I needed to take out. So this is one clever hack you can use like to use two uh, palm nuts to take out the backlash in the system. So these are two offset, you, you can offset one next to the other to take out. So these are all quality optimizations you can do on the design. Then uh, the other one was I've been trying to make uh, small spindles for a long time and none of them really worked until I found one, which kind of works. It is a friction drive aluminum spindle with a body that is 3D printed. And here you can see this is the bit holding uh, and the green part is made out of uh, aluminum. And here they have, a, it has a kinematic joint onto the main thing. We made the blue aluminum part on our, on our lathe. And this is where it holds a bit. And so you can have multiple tools that are set to the same height. So you can, you can have, it, it's like a quick tool changer, but manual. Then it's driven by this polyurethane wheel, which gets you the final spindle that is this. So the main advantage, one, it's 3D printed. Two, it is a one is to five gear ratio. So the motor can spin at 5,000 RPM, the, spin, uh, the bit spins at 25,000, which is good when you want to uh, lower the vibrations of the motor. So I tested the motor, uh, the friction drive gets up to 60 degrees in warmth and it stays there, so it is stable and it is a usable. Uh, I, could, I could use both the one by 64 plus the one by 32 end mill for this. So it kind of works. And these are the quality you can get out of it. It's a really low run out, you can make it in the lab itself. It's made out of aluminum. Uh, so all the 3D printed parts are not getting anywhere worn down, it's all bearings. So one of our students uh, seeing this made Sahin Pala, he made a controller board for the Pico. He called it a Neo Pi wireless. And we are using this board right now to run the machine. Okay, and in this, so, and we presented the whole thing in Bali in the Fab Fest in 2022. This is the first ever uh, Pico that has been delivered to one Fab Lab and it is in Bali right now. And here, uh, I wanted to main, show mainly the portability of it. So I have a picture here. So this is how you can pack the whole machine into it. And you can get this through airport security, which is an important thing. <laughs> so this is the whole kit. And this is the only special parts you need. Everything else is 3D printed or standard parts. So whichever fab lab you are, you can either make or buy one of these small things super easily. So um, Rahul, that's great. We're gonna have to go on. Um, that's a lot yeah. of progress since and I last saw the update. In particular, there have been a lot of bad spindles. It's nice to see a good spindle. Yes, <laughs> for PCB, yes. Thank yeah. you. Okay, okay. Um, so now we're gonna go into Danielle who, um, in Gracia, who just in just a few years turned from machine building uh, beginner to machine building force of nature. So Danielle. Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Garcia and uh, I did Fab Academy 2015, as Neil said, everything started from there. And I'm uh, currently running a small company uh, making uh, open source uh, machinery. 
So I'm talking alone today, but I'm actually talking for all these people you see on the screen, which is my team. So we are a group of uh, machine builders that all together built uh, the machines you will see in the next slides. And uh, most of them come from FabLab roots. So we have Fab Academy graduates, uh, Fab Academy graduates, and all have some kind of roots uh, in the FabLabs. So our company is consisting of 400 square meter um, uh, space. Uh, we have built um, till now uh, 53 different machines. We have delivered uh, these machines in seven different countries, in seven different uh, countries and three different continents. Uh, we have been writing a book. We have been publishing four papers and we are located in Hamburg with 10 employees. So that's the numbers of the machines. So those are some of the machines that we've been building in the past. So we started in 2016 with a large format um, uh, laser cutter. And going on, we have been always pushing forward and forward uh, till the last year, where we basically tried to build the entire FabLab inventory as uh, open source FabLab replicable uh, machinery. So our main project is called OpenLab Starter Kit, and it consists of a set of open source machines where all the design must be accessible to everyone, including the documentation for it. And uh, with this machine, we also do a lot of workshops where we transfer the knowledge about how to build these machines to, to peoples. And we try to replicate the machines locally. So you can see here that one of these machines was built, was built in Bali, in Indonesia. One was built in, in Ukraine, one in US, one in Tunisia, one in Portugal. And uh, this is thanks to the fact that we try to use as uh, standard and simple and cheaper materials as possible. So we're almost at the end of the project where we will uh, de develop uh, further this machine to be almost market comparable. And our efforts are also shown in two papers. So this is a paper published in the Fab, Fab, uh, Fab Fest in, in Bali, where we explain the process of developing such uh, open hardware laser cutter. And recently, we published also a paper where, Neil, by the way, you are also a reviewer of this paper in Albert Hicks, where basically we explained the progress on this. And we also made some benchmarks about the laser cutter. So everything that we do is already published online. So if you are taking a picture of this, uh, the QR code, you can already check everything and download all the design files and documentation. So documentation for us is very important because uh, how people can replicate the machines if they don't have proper instructions or useful information. So this was the first approach was a PDF based a sort of IKEA style building manual um, to replicate the laser cutter. But now we are switching to basically our online assembly manual, which by the way, we also have a small demo here is uh, based on a source file or a step file. And you can basically uh, navigate the steps and explore the parts that you need to assemble every time. So in this way, we just give to the system as an input, a step file, and then the system will automatically generate the documentation because one of the problems we have is also to update the documentation quickly. So those are the machines uh, we are gonna make is basically covering the basic uh, fab lab um, equipment uh, uh, needs. So you see, we have laser cutters, CNC milling machines, 3D printers and so on. So for example, this is a small format laser cutter that we deploy in schools uh, here in Germany. Um, and some example of what you can do with it. This is a large format laser cutter based on the same design. Um, and here are some examples of the work that we can do with it. Uh, this is uh, a small format CNC milling machine with two half tool changers. So we have developed uh, our own software and electronics to make CNC machine tool changer if you want to check it. We also have made a cheap a large format milling machine based uh, on a mixture of aluminum and steel profiles. And here are some examples of what they can do. Then this is uh, the version two of the new 3D printer is uh, uh, based on Clipper. It runs uh, up to 1.2 meters per second. It's one of the fastest 3D printers we have been having here in my company. We use it to produce all the parts. We also have made a large format 3D printer, which is currently in further developments, which can print by cubic meter. Here are some examples of what can be done. And also a vinyl cutter, which costs less than 100 euros at the moment. And it can uh, you can change the tool by hand. And you can put a knife or either a pen into it. And last but not least, also a 3D scanner, which works with photogrammetry and three cameras at the same time. And here you can see the real piece on one side and the 3D scanner piece on the other side. So we are also recently making our own software for our machines that we call OLOS, Open Lab uh, Operating System. This will be basically a full-blown Linux distribution that you deploy in your machine and you will have all the tools to run the machines uh, open source. So there is even a small demo 
about it, you can, for example, generate the G code. So for example, these are laser cutting G code. You can say this is the cutout and this part is gonna be the engraving, for example. So like you can change, you can take the layers and take the colors and generate the G code directly on the machine. Here's the file manager. We can you can upload the files uh, Wi-Fi to the machine. Here the controls where you can joke, change the uh, the, the feed rate. Uh, here you even have a, a joke previewer, which will work also with the camera. Uh, and then you can see exactly where the job is uh, positioned. And then you also have a console where you can send the commands directly to the to the firmware. And uh, here you also have uh, a way to uh, debug the system. So we have a built-in debugger. Good, so we are also developing our own electronics. This is uh, our new full-blown controller, which has basically a Raspberry Pi uh, 2040 uh, controller on board plus, uh, plus a TNC. This embeds all the functions we need. And the tool changer code, it runs uh, on, the, on the Pico, so on the RP 2040. Furthermore, everything we do is documented in a wiki. And in this wiki, we talk about everything you need to know about building machines. For example, I don't know, we tested some models, we compare these models with several models, and we see the speed, and we make a graph, or we test new sensors. And all of this documentation will come out at the end of the project. So it's going to be a sort of Wikipedia of machine building. So we also built some custom machines like this five axis cylindrical positioning system, uh, which is able of an, of an accuracy of 10 microns uh, for a university. And recently we published a book together with Jean Michel, which I hope is online. <laughs> so the book is already out and it's a book that talks about uh, the old, old machines. It's an overview about all machines that you have in Fab Labs. Plus there is a chapter about machine building. The, so if you want to start building machines, you can also take a reference on this book. It's already, uh, it's already published out. And these are sneak peek on the new machines we are making. So we are making a laser cutter with a tool changer, which will allow to switch between three different laser sources. Uh, we are making a large format 3D printer, which can tilt the bed and it uses a flying gantry mechanism. And it has a one meter like, Corex Y system. <laughs> And uh, then we're also working on a large format CNC, which this time will use a new approach, which consists of rotating the ball screw nut instead of rotating of the, the ball screw to reduce the wobbliness of the, of the ball screw. So these are the new developments. Thank you. So here is my email if you want to contact us. Thanks a lot. So Danielle, is that all you've done? I think you could get more, more done than that. That doesn't seem like very much. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, that, that, that's an amazing range of progress. That, that's just spectacular. OK, so from Danielle, we're now going to go on to Jens, who turned the, toward the world and then became a machine builder. So uh, how's my audio? Super. So uh, I think Leo already gave me a great introduction. So I'm, I'm a former FabLab nomad. And and ended up starting Fab Lab here in my hometown. And that's where I am now. I'm actually, I stepped back from running the Fab Lab that I created with peers, but uh, I'm uh, renting a studio space in this Fab Lab. So what we're gonna do today is a, a video tour. Uh, so I'm gonna show you a little bit how I work, you know, with my 20 square meter studio. And, uh, you know, you can see here that I have basically built my own dream machine, which is one of the exciting things about being a machine builder. Um, you know, go, go also going a bit hardcore on you know uh, fabricating my own rack and pinion and drive system. So all these parts you see here were actually fabricated in the fab lab uh, downstairs that I have created with Pearson. I thought it would be fun to to show you the um, uh, here with what you're learning in class. You can see uh, uh, this little PCB. Breakout board was milled, you know, so it's a tiny little bit of the skills you learn in class. And the soldier mask is also made on the on the laser cutter. Here. And uh, something I'm working on um, is uh, it's is not so easy to see, but this is a uh, you know pellet extruder that's going a bit slow, but that's going to be exciting. So uh, large format 3D printing together with milling. Then I have the you know what Neil calls a cheap and cheerful uh, PCB milling machine from China and a 3D printer from China. And then I wanted to, to tell you about this exciting thing because uh, I bought this uh, small machining center secondhand, not functional with you know non-working electronics. And I would never have dared to buy a broken machine, uh, I say a broken 
vertical machining center if it wasn't for the fact that I've done so much machine building. So you can see in here uh, all the um, all the usual things, you know, redundant contactor for safety, power switches, and all these things. So by by doing this, by doing this myself, I was able to have a kind of machine in my studio that uh, cash flow would uh, otherwise uh, uh, facilitate. Uh, you can see here are some tools in progress for the machine for cool changing. So uh, Jake's going to touch more on that, but usually we have a little marker, we have an indexable knife, we have a, a print head for 3D printing. So I can do, you know, as you can see here with the large Z axis, I can do pretty large format 3D printing. Here's uh, Jake's open hardware design. So that's a nice thing to showcase, you know, things flowing between us uh, machine builders as well. Let's see if I can get this uh, working one handed. Pull the handle, and now we have an indexable knife. And you can see then that the knife is lower than the milling bit, so that uh, you know I don't need to change that powerful spindle because that's more difficult to do. So uh, right now we're gonna do it's demo time. So I'm gonna start the spindle, uh, then we're gonna start the dust extraction, and then we're gonna do a small milling job. Then. <laughs> Jens, did you turn off audio? We don't hear anything. It's probably so loud, it's just all getting clipped. You can hear like a little bit of it. But let's see, but he's also lost focus. And can you hear me? Um, let's use, oh, Jens, <coughs> sorry, Jens, can you hear me? All right, uh, I hope all of that was full screen because sometimes with Zoom and who's talking last and talking the loudest can be a bit difficult. Sorry, yeah, <clears throat> Len, yeah, your audio dropped out. Show us the part you made. <clears throat> uh, one second. <clears throat> Wait, oh, yeah, here. <laughs> um, two questions. Uh, uh, I think, uh, let me get this one. Since I, since I botched the, the demo, it's more fun to show my, my friend to it again. <laughs> um, Jens, two questions. Um, I, I, I think you've set the record for parent, child, and grandchild machine. Can you talk about yes. that? And then talk about your rack and pinion approach. Yes, one second. Uh, can you see my uh, shared screen? Yes. Awesome. Sure. So, uh, yeah, so with this machine uh, here, it's called Hanso. There's a link in the repo. But you can see here that um, I used the shop bot to fabricate this machine. And I use this one to prototype more of a sort of classic three axis, you know, shop up type machine. You can see it over here. And then, um, and then uh, I cloned it, which was super cool, like to demo. So the whole machine is designed so that the whole kit sheet uh, fits on the machine. So that you can make about 80% of its own parts. And then we assembled that over in the United States for a project. And actually Neil and I milled this circuit board together. And it was a bit painful for those who know that test. This was done with a broken end mill. <laughs> That's why it looks terrible. But it actually, the position was really good. <laughs> it 
Neil, uh, you, you, uh, you can explain this test better than me. I think that uh, that's fine. It's it's uh, it uh, to to yeah I don't know like to 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 be able to have so many machines making each other in a row and then to screw it together on the other side of the world and and to have being capable of making PCBs for fab class even though it has a work area of uh, two and a half meter that that's pretty exciting. And Jens has been very disciplined about tracking the moving boundary between how many parts he buys and how many of the parts of his machine he can make. Um, yeah, so I, I I wanted to share that also that I it's like it's not easy, you know that. Uh, I feel like if you want to make reasonable uh, uh, rational machines, you basically you're more you know making a shopping list and you buy all these you know buy linear rails and aluminum extrusions and and all these different parts and you make some brackets to put it hold it all together in the corners and so that's not all that exciting but at the same time when you start making your own drive system your own rails and all these things it's just it becomes more like a all well, the veterans car veteran car you know like a old, old timer like you it's not so easy that balance but it's very exciting to explore and... okay uh thank you jens we have to go on to jake now so um all of these machines are exciting but they contain lots of assumptions. And at the heart is that machines, you send files to controllers. And so based on the history, we'll talk more about, uh, Jake has been revisiting uh, the fundamental machine architecture. So take over, Jake. Sure. Um, you had uh, Quentin here for Urumbu and the capstan drive. I don't know if you want to. Well, uh, Jake and Quentin, just you know, 10 minutes to talk about whatever you want to talk about. Okay. Oh boy. Um, well, hey, everyone. I'm Jake. I'm one of Neil's uh, PhD students. Um, yeah, and I've been working on machine building for a while. So I'll share a screen. Um, so let's see. The most, the biggest project, project probably for me is, is Clank. This is a machine design. Um, that has a modular tool changer, as we were discussing earlier. So um, there's the printer. And then uh, here's the printer head, which I can talk about as well. But um, this all is removable. Jens has one of these on his machine. Uh, and this tool changer has the advantage over some others that it's uh, a little bit easier to manufacture. And it's a little, little bit stiffer. Um, and it has, as well, this data link uh, involved. So when you plug your tool in, you also get two USB ports and one RS-45 port out to your tool. Um, and there's a list of, of all kinds of things here uh, on clank.tools. So we made this ultra plotter, which has uh, RGB and CMYK. Uh, this is a version of Jens's uh, rotary. Oh no, this is an, another rotary. There's Jens's rotary device. Um, at one point, Alfonso just slapped a Makita router on this thing and turned out to work great. Um, and then we have this extruder, uh, which is fun. And maybe it's actually the most interesting thing to talk about. So, um, so this is a printer. Actually, there's a paper on this coming out shortly. Um, and uh, it's a printer, which is more or less a normal printer. Um, except that it has a couple of sensors. So we've snuck a load cell in between the hot end and the extruder. This is actually kind of common now. The Prusa does this. Um, and the Prusa just uses it to tap the bed, but we use it actually to make a model of the rheology that's going on. So there's the load cell, and then there's also a feed sensor, which shows us actually how much filament is traveling through the printer, because it's often the case that you're actually slipping a little bit. Um, and so we can use those instruments to make this model of, of what's going on in the hot end. So on the x-axis, we have the temperature. And on the y, we have the flow rate, um, the cubic flow rate through, the, through the, the hot end. And then we're mapping a pressure, basically. So we're, and the, the pressure goes to one when the extruder can't extrude anymore. And so we get sort of a map of where, where, you, where it's possible to extrude with the machine. And the idea is that instead of just doing this sort of in a feed forward way where we set the parameters in a slicer and then we like bake the G code and then put it on the machine and then like hope it works. We're getting as much information as we can from the machine. Um, and then in the future, the machine will actually be doing all of the sort of parameter initiative on its own. In the current version, uh, we have sort of a Python script that looks at that data and then, and then writes the parameters that work. Um, <clears throat> and then 
yeah, the, I think sort of the, the broad topic is doing feedback systems assembly. So um, we've shown that we can do something like that for the hot end. So we can like induce the parameters for the hot end, but we want to do that as well for motion control. And so this is a motor that we can uh, use data for the motor in order to figure out what the maximum acceleration is for the machine. And we get a little bit more in depth than that. We don't just get one value for acceleration. We get a whole map of permissible accelerations given your current velocity. So basically we're pulling a torque curve out of the motor. Um, and we can use that to start to do look ahead planning, uh, which is something that Quentin and I are really interested in doing um, and hopefully using a better representation as well for the geometry in there. So Jake, I want to get to I want to get to some time for Quentin. Also, can you get to modular things, the the fundamental architecture behind yeah. all of this? Yeah. So so and and this is why it matters. This is the current map of what you need to do or deal with in order to make a part. You have your CAD, your CAM, then you make some G code, then you give it to the controller. We really want to bring a lot of the things that are in the controller, sort of more uh, online or more into layers where they're accessible to us as programmers. So into Python or JavaScript. Um, and, uh, so let's see, yeah, modular things, um, modular things is a thing that we did maybe a year ago now, basically where, uh, we quickly turn embedded devices into software, uh, objects. Um, so, uh, you can go to the modular things editor. Um, and if you plug in a device, it, it shows up over here on the right panel and you, and you can program with it. Um, so, oh man, we had a video. If you click the, if you click the picture, I think it, or the first one, does it go oh, to nice. it? Yeah. Yeah. So we have a three minute video. I don't know, Neil, if we have time for this right now, but, um, we can well, we don't, skip to the punchline. Well, I'll cover some of this in class, um, but if you just just here's, if, the, if, yeah. here's a sort of screenshot of it. Um, yeah, so we plug these devices in, and then they show up on the right hand panel, and they announce their APIs, and that's all sort of real time discoverable. Um, so it means that instead of like writing down a G code and hoping it does what you think it does, instead you're interacting with the devices directly, and they're telling you what their capabilities are, um, and so. Uh, sort of in the big arc, if someone else made one of these devices and they gave it to you, you could immediately program with it. Can you show the range of fabricatable ones? M fabricatable modular things? Yeah. 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 So we have also, we made this uh, portion of the website. This is modularthings.com slash things. Um, and these are all designs that are open. And if you click on each of these, uh, they show you the, the routed thing and the schematic. Uh, and then a little bit of the software as well. And you can go over here and you can find your way to the source on GitHub. Um, yeah, and then how so maybe for, that, yeah. yeah, for time, maybe uh, if Quentin could pick up to talk about how he's been using these in both mechanisms and controls. Uh, I was, um, was going to talk, talk a bit about Roombrew, actually. OK. Okay, so so then I think one one more quick thing is uh, all of that works on top of OSAP, which is actually the sort of networking backend. You can read more about that here. Um, I'm trying to start actually publish the protocol, um, and then uh, recently uh, I made it much easier to make modular things. So rather than um, writing, uh, basically it writes about half of the code for you automatically. Um, so if you have an Arduino code and you want to turn it into a modular thing, that's like a five minute project now. Um, and then I did this, I wrote, uh, uh, I wrote up what I did with Nadia for my generals, uh, into this blog post, uh, which is looking more broadly at the sort of economics of open source and open source hardware in particular. Um, and, uh, looking to figure out how we get towards uh, an ecosystem where making things with other people's open hardware contributions is more like making things with other people's open software contributions. Okay. Um, yeah, and then that's it. So, so then to transition, so Jake is breaking the central controller into distributed systems to make it easy to change the machine. And then Arumbo is a project looking at what is the min minimal state in the machine. So Quentin, take over about uh, five-ish minutes, maybe five to seven minutes, and then we'll end. Oh, I, I don't need to take two minutes. Um, yeah, so 
as Neil said, Rumbo is asking the opposite question, which is what if the devices don't have a state and what if there's a computer talking to each of them uh, in a centralized manner? So I think you already had the output device lecture. So you've seen this circuit, which was Neil driving a stepper from a USB cable. And there are two parts to that. It was powered through the USB cable, but also uh, controlled. So the computer was sending a single uh, byte per step that the stepper would make, which means that if you want to make the stepper move at any you know, speed you want, it's just about varying the rate at which you're sending those bytes. And we he found that you can send up to a few thousands of steps per second, which is fine for, you know, reasonable machines, not not high performance CNC mini machines, but if you're just trying out things, then it's good enough. And so when Neil went to Haystack, he made this um, drawing machine. And this was also a time to test this uh, Kevlar string that, that he was really excited about. And so this is a very cheap to make and very basic uh, drawing machine controlled by a computer and tiny. So every again, every step that every that, uh, that those steppers are taking is one byte sent by the computer. And then, um, let's see, Neil challenged me to drive a two D machine from this capstan drive, like you know, a Cartesian stage. And this was the results. This is uh, Core XY that's completely um, Kevlar string based, and you see this capstan here, which came from a brainstorm with uh, Jake, and it's you know minimal cost. We we picked the cheapest uh, pass we could find for for this whole thing, and again the steppers are controlled by one USB cable each. So if you go to this repo, you'll see a Python application. Um, that's meant to be run on a computer connected to that machine. There is no motherboard to speak of. It's just this network of devices. Uh, and then, yeah, there are more, a few more examples of this capstan drive if you're interested. Um, and if you have some string around, it has to be low stretch string. So that's why we picked this uh, military grade Kevlar. Uh, I found that steel, nylon coated steel, works quite well as well. And if you're in a pinch, you can even print your own extrusion. You don't need to use an aluminum extrusion. This will wear out eventually, but <laughs> it's a it's a fun way to make a machine in a pinch. Okay. Okay, and um, if Yanni's on, he's been continuing the Rumbu direction. Um, and so uh, we'll end with. Uh, Elon Moyer and Nadia Peak started this direction of instead of CAD to CAM to machine control to motion control, um, revisiting uh, those uh, divisions to make object oriented hardware. And so, um, uh, Nadia, take over. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Hi, Neil. Um, yes, I uh, was a PhD student in the Center for Bits and Atoms a while ago now. I uh, graduated in 2016, and I am a professor at the University of Washington now, where I run machine agency, where we do a lot of machine building. Um, here is our website. Um, we're always recruiting more grad students or postdocs. Um, and like Neil said, um, my machine building journey started a long time ago um, with Alan and also Jonathan Ward. Um, we built a lot of machines using the machines that we had access to um, in the Fab Lab and in the Center for Bits and Atoms, including machines where we could change the tools. Um, this is the first instance of a machine with a Core XY 
um, where we could use it as a milling machine and as a 3D printer. Um, but then we quickly started thinking, oh, you know, actually, um, it would be good to make lots of different kinds of custom machines. What and what would that take? What would it take to make lots of different custom machines that can do different things? And so um, we developed uh, extensible control systems to be able to add functionality to machines and remove it without um, having to redesign its control boards. And also, um, we tried to make the simplest version of a modular machine. Uh, this is the cardboard machine kit that I worked on with James Coleman and Alain Moyer. Um, and there were a lot of Fab Academy people who in Machine Building Week used the uh, cardboard machine kit and the modular machines and uh, controllers to make machines. Um, I think uh, uh, the diversity of machines is, uh, I don't know, well documented, um, but many of these uh, can, projects continue to live on. Um, some of the fab labs that maybe are here now, uh, and I guess uh, machines are great. But uh, we're interested also. I'm interested in how do you support people who are using machines, or how do you support the creative practice that comes from machines? So, for example, if you guys have browsed the um, if you've browsed the hashtag Plotter Twitter, there's so many people that are doing really inventive things with machines and how do you support um, how do you support practices like that so sometimes we study artists or scientists who are doing complicated things um, with uh, with their machines to try to understand how to better um, support them and one of the things that we found is that um, maintenance and and just uh, being able to um, troubleshoot with the machine is a huge part of digital fabrication. And so how do we create systems that not just allow you to build the machine for the first time, um, but also allow support the maintenance and troubleshooting with the machine um, as people use them. Um, I'm gonna skip through this. Sometimes we also try to understand what professionals are doing with digital fabrication to be able to create better systems to support that. So uh, let's skip through this. Um, and this is a, this is a machine that uh, was led by Sonia Vasquez in my group, uh, Jubilee. Um, and Jubilee is a multi-tool machine with automated tool changing, of which uh, Jake and many others also have examples, Daniela. Um, and uh, like PopFab, it uses a Maxwell coupling to be able to precisely pick up and drop off the tools um, without having to recalibrate each time. Um, and so, and it uses a cable driven tool locking mechanism. And this is just so that you can automatically pick up and drop off tools. So in the pop-up video, you saw that we were manually changing the tools and this is so that we're automatically changing tools. Um, and when automatically changing tools, you can start doing things like multi-tool multi -tool workflows that have, for example, a camera and a syringe or a 3D printer and a milling machine, like many others uh, are also talking about. Um, we're interested in replication, like Daniela and others, uh, Rahul. Um, and so what does it take? So one of, sometimes one of the things that we study is what does it take to actually get other people to build your machines? Um, lots of documentation is part of it, um, but also um, making sure that the parts that you are including are sourceable um, in many parts of the world and uh, the assembly process can be um, quality controlled by people who are also not experts. Um, so we've continued using Jubilee in many different contexts and specifically we're finding that lots of scientists are interested in using Jubilee for laboratory automation workflows. Um, this is uh, the Duckbot Jubilee, a version of the Jubilee that we use to manipulate duckweed, which is a small aquatic plant, which is a cool model organism for uh, scientific experiments. Um, and we also, adapted um, the OpenTron's pipette tool um, from the OT2 to be able to work on the Jubilee so that we can do different kinds of bulk liquid transfer, um, pipetting, imaging uh, of microscopes and webcams um, and other kinds of duckweed manipulation. And we are controlling these machines not from slicers and cam packages, which doesn't make so much sense for science workflows, but we're controlling them from Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so we have 
the Science Jubilee Library where you can load the machines and, um, and then do different kinds of machine operations directly from um, computational notebooks. And you can analyze the data that you're collecting with the machine in the notebook and use that to plan um, next steps, which allows you to prototype different kinds of feedback loops with the machines. Um, so here is a Jubilee where we're ins inspecting, um, um, we're inspecting biological samples for and trying to figure out different ways in which we can do, um, you know, clinical image recognition workflows. Um, we're also doing different kinds of automation of duckweed growth. Um, what conditions, even if the salinity is increasing of the duckweed habitat, under what conditions can duckweed, for example, still thrive? Can we automatically collect data for that? Um, and we're also trying to create new ways in which experiment planning can rely on things like reinforcement learning um, to be able to optimize how many experiments you end up having to do and having that be um, happening in an automated fashion as well. And so, um, I don't know, we have, uh, we have some papers out about things like that, for example, for um, discovering new ways to develop, um, to develop uh, crystals for, for things like uh, solar panels. Um, anyway, so how can you make feedback loops that cross the digital physical divide with all of this machine building? You're able to also do a lot of really in-depth software um, integration. Um, I wanted to show also, so we also have a extension of creative coding environment um, uh, P5. This is a uh, P5.fab, which you can use to control um, existing machines um, to make uh, to make things that perhaps are very non-trivial to make with a slicer. And then maybe the last thing I want to show, uh, is inspired by Jens's explorations in two-sided milling a long time ago, is here's another computational notebook um, system. This one is designed specifically to interface with CNC mills. And it's to support people who are doing two-sided milling where there's a lot of things that have to happen that aren't necessarily represented in the machine or in the code. Um, and so this is in observable notebooks. This is a work by Jasper Tran O'Leary uh, where we have a um, uh, communication with Fusion 360 um, and a augmented reality projector that projects into your work envelope that helps you do all of the different tasks necessary, like um, creating the fixture and alignment for your parts, um, sending information um, from the mill to Fusion and back, um, um, zeroing your end mill on top of your material as opposed to on the bed. Um, anyway, it's a it's a way of, um, and we're doing a bunch of different kinds of uh, tool path visualizations that help you see what the machine is going to do um, and not be surprised by sudden motions. To be able to do um, two-sided milling. Um, so here are different parts that can't be milled in one go and need to be flipped over and might need to be flipped over in different directions. Um, how do you support that? And so we're creating software for that kind of thing. Great. Okay, thank you, Nadia. And um, let me end with a homework assignment. Uh, I adore each of you and each of your projects. Um, there's tremendous dialogue among all of you spiritually in what you're working on, but each of you essentially implemented everything yourself. Each of you did your mechanisms and your electronics and your controls. And there's almost no sharing at a technical level across your projects. Um, but we're sharing ideas, Neil. No, I know, but you know, one of Jake's diatribes is the lack of something like NPM or PIP for machine building. I, what would it take to start sharing technical content as well as ideas? I think it's gonna take a minute. I think if you look at the history of open software, like we had information hiding in like 1979 and then object oriented programming like shortly thereafter. And then like four decades later, we got NPM. And like people needed to get used to that method of integrating systems before there was a way to have direct integration. Like Leo and Quentin and I always talk about design patterns versus designs. 
And right now we're at that stage where everyone's just sort of working out the design patterns. And then eventually it'll anneal into like, oh, this is the type of tool changer we like, and this is the particular implementation. And then we can have our direct interoperability party. But well, I think that's a good framing that if, if Fab 2.0 is machines making machines, the, the Fab 1.0 era development of Fab 2.0 is you had to do everything. But in the Fab 2.0 era, I, I think it's time to start figuring out how to share designs. Uh, share technical, uh, not overall it's a, system design. It's a really non-trivial task though to share. I think uh, the amount of work that goes into just, even if I were, even I as a, I would say highly skilled machine builder, to, for me to replicate the work that has been shown here is very, very non-trivial. Um, and then if you add to that, that perhaps there are people with Less familiarity with each other and each other's work, and it, it's not um, it's not just something where you're like, oh, Neil told us to do it, and therefore we should do it. It's uh, <laughs> it's like, what? Do you uh, mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, turns out you should not always do everything Neil says. So. <laughs> the... But I will say though, at the same time, if you design something to be replicable, then it's better for everyone, yourself included. And yeah, that comes it, from my. It's like a replicatable for who, though the the I think the things that you question. design are replicatable for me, perhaps because I am familiar with a lot of parts of your tool chain. Um, but you know, a lot of people maybe just don't want to have a big virtual Linux machine that they have to use to do everything with. <laughs> it's a. That's a good yeah. point. Yeah, but when I write code, and I you know I write it specifically to be to be shareable, it ends up being higher quality codes for myself as well. And I end up reusing it, you know, years later. Whereas if I botched something together, then probably won't get reused. So sometimes I think, I think there's it's something also there. I think it's also sometimes just a application driven because uh, with a science jubilee, there's a lot of scientists that are building science jubilees who really don't care about machine building. They just think it's all very annoying and they just want to get their data. Uh, and, but they're like, oh, but with this thing, we can, we can do the things that, um, otherwise would be extremely tedious for us to be doing manually. And so, um, they're like, okay, well, as long as there's enough documentation for us to actually get to the place where we're going to get the thing that we actually want, which is scientific results, then we'll do it. Um, and it's not, it's not that um, there was some threshold that we crossed. We're like, now we've made our documentation good enough, or now we have made it replicatable enough. It also has to be useful. I, yep. uh, speaking to this too, like when we worked on modular things, I was intending to use that in Blot. Um, but when we went into production, it, it to use the devices themselves costs like $10 more per machine, uh, which wasn't justifiable. So we ended up just like, taking out parts of the system and the design patterns that are now incorporated into Blot, but not the physical boards. Yeah, like modularity in software is free because at the end of the day, your compiler deletes it. And the thing that runs is not actually modular, but it, the design patterns are modular, the software, they're the code, right? Um, and in hardware, that's not really true. So it's like, there's really, and there's also <clears throat> in software, there's one interface, which is your API or really is the language. In hardware, there's multiple interfaces. There's network interfaces, there's mechanical interfaces, there's additionally software interfaces at multiple levels. Um, and then there's like CAD and all this other shit. So it's really hard to, you know, it's almost like we need a different a new tool at each of those layers. Um, and there hasn't been the decades of work that's been done to make software so like sort of seamless. So in a way, I think like what we're doing right now is great. We're all talking to each other. We should probably, that's the number one thing to do would be to talk to each other more um, and like sharing what we know. So we're not all trying to relearn the same stuff over and over again. And um, and then, yeah, I think, you know, it'll take a little while, but we'll get towards interoperable stuff. The other thing is the businesses need to start doing it. Like Daniele has the team of like 10 people. And so like, that's awesome. But then there's, you know, there's like Fanuc, Siemens, like all these huge, like people spend a lot of money trying to make these machines. And they're all doing it in a way that's closed source and proprietary. And if we can somehow try to get them onto the like uh, interoperability train, then then it's like we did it. Um, and so we do need to think about like why, like how do you tip that sort of 
it's like a hopping hopping uh what's it called local minima great uh, okay so we're up to five after so with those challenges for the future um thank you all for a spectacular tour through machine building and you're anybody excited you're invited to join in Always a pleasure. And with that, I'll stop recording.